my name is Carlos Lucino, and uh, in June, I had brain surgery for a tumor that was found in the same month, and it turned out to be um, stage two brain cancer. And now I am living the, the brain cancer life of just waiting to see what happens on a day-by-day -day basis and then MRI by MRI basis. It's like being in a comic book and walking around with a question mark over my head. But what can you do when I, when I start to have these thoughts? I just laugh to myself. Just take the day, take, take my life day by day, because that's the way that I've always lived. You know, nothing phases Carlos. He goes into the jungle in South America, you know, places no one has gone before. Um, Carlos is just not scared of anything. That's how he lives his life. That's kind of what, that's, that's just how he is. I don't know. Carlos is just a very, uh, you know, incredibly positive, upbeat person. No matter what he was facing, he was f almost fascinated by what was happening, wanted to understand it, wanted to have insight into it, wanted to talk it through, and then faced it fearlessly. I mean, he just said, hmm, that's what needs to be done. Let's do it. Let's get it done with. I knew right away that I was dealing with um, someone who was the, one of the best in the world at what they do. I could just tell that he was so specialized in neurosurgery and he knew so much about the brain that he was on a different plane of intellectual existence. I could tell just within five minutes of meeting him. He looks at preserving the humanity, he looks at preserving your personality, but from a scientific approach and from all of his experience. My objective was not to treat his x-ray or his MRI. It was to make sure that we got what we needed to do, which was to establish what was wrong, take the pressure off the brain, remove as much tumor as was safe to do, but most of all, to return him to his life, his friends, his work, uh, you know, all the beautiful things going on in his life that he wanted to get back to. He respected the fact that it was more about um, the quality of my life right now at this stage than it was about just removing as much of the tumor as possible. Part of why I feel I can be so uh, dedicated to the patient is I know that what they're getting behind the scenes is an extraordinary amount of expertise and technology that is uniquely available at Hopkins. Navigation systems, computer systems, intraoperative CAT scans, we have intraoperative MRIs, and we have seen uh, through the research efforts of our department uh, more than a doubling of the average survival of patients with malignant brain tumors. He wants to help as many people as possible is the perspective that I got. And he wants to approach it in the most logical way possible. I don't know, I feel like bonded to him and I don't want to let him go. You know, I really, I really like, he did such a fantastic job. He saved my life that uh, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't ever want to be far. A lot of my friends are talking about moving to New York right now, for example. I'm going to be so far from Hopkins. I, I can't do that. I can't do that. Not for years, not for a few years, not until I figure this out. But I've never felt that way about anything. I've always lived for what I, sh which, what I felt like I should be doing, the adventurous move. But he is, he's something I'm dependent on now. And a lot of it has to do with just the psychological comfort of knowing him and of, of being one of his patients. In the end, the people who choose to have surgery here, uh, the decision becomes a very personal one. It's not about the institution, it's not about the name, it's about trusting another human being to help them. And I think once that basis of trust is established, that is the basis of a long-term relationship. And it doesn't end with the surgery. 